so next, um, next John. Um, we have John Romano from uh, Nickel Brook Brewing Company. So if you can introduce yourself. And Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is John Romano. I own and operate Better Bitters and Nickelbrook Beers. We have two companies. We first opened up in 1991. Uh, quit my day job to follow my passion of home brewing. So I opened up a little U brew, and it kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And we were doing a fair amount of beer, and to meet the demands of, of our beer business, we decided to build a little brewery. So a uh, great idea, let's build a little brewery where we're gonna basically make beer juice because of that when you make wort is called wort is called beer juice, we were gonna sell it to ourselves. And that was gonna be the core of the business. In the midst of building the brewery, um, twenty four for twenty four showed up in the industry and, and our beer sales almost disappeared totally. Whoever would have thought that a case of beer was gonna drop from Thirty-four to thirty-six dollars to twenty-four. Uh, lovely Lakeport, which is another story. You can have a few beers over that one. But anyways, I wish everybody had a beer right now. You know. um, but anyways, we were left with quite an investment of several hundreds and thousands of dollars, and uh, we decided to bring the brewery to another level and become a micro. In the midst of uh, doing all that, there was many licensing and different applications and permits to get with the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. And if anybody's dealt with the government, I'm not probably some government people here, but it took a while to get that permit. And once we did, uh, we started, uh, you know, selling the beer and not realizing what a difficult market we had chosen. When you think about it, you look at the beer industry. I'm competing against the world. You walk into a liquor store. There are beers from all over the world. And we did not realize, so I put on my you know, salesman hat, started peddling my wares you know, downtown Burlington, and went into many local establishments, which I'm not gonna name many of them, and not one of them wanted to do business with me. And I was like, this is unbelievable. I could not understand how a local little brewery could not get the support from its own you know, restaurants and licensees locally. So we started going into Toronto and different areas and we were finding that we were getting much more reception outside of our own town. Um, it's almost like made in Burlington can't be any good. You know, what water are you using? Where are you getting your ingredients? It became quite a battle. And uh, it was very, very difficult. And you started hiring sales reps and you put them in Western Ontario and Eastern Ontario and into Toronto. And the first five years were very, very difficult. And we decided to start looking at niche areas. And um, you know, one of the niche products we put out was an apple beer. And then one after that, we became an organic certified brewery. Another big one was a gluten-free. We launched Ontario's first gluten-free beer. And it's been very, very tough as a small brewer. We had to branch off into many different areas and, and you know, slowly a little bit of gluten-free beer, a little bit of apple beer, a little bit of organic beer, and the breweries finally come together. And people don't realize, you know, how poorly commercially brewed beer is made. Um, you look at most domestic beer made in North America, the main component of that beer is invert corn sugar, fructose. People don't know most domestic beer is 40 to 60 percent corn and invert corn sugar and it's not even on the label there's nobody governing and regulating this a label's been approved 10 15 20 years ago they changed the ingredients and they have no there's no one policing this when we're gluten-free and organic certified we have inspections on a yearly basis we have to certify that we're only putting barley in our products and we have to show them the origin and everything. When we do a gluten-free beer, we have to certify that it's gluten-free, have it tested, so we can't play with it, especially someone's health. And people are just buying on brand. Beers become how much money do you have to put in the brand. So beer's not about quality in the product, it's how much money do you have for branding. Most domestic beer, a third of their general operating budgets go into marketing. When you buy a case of beer, when you buy a, a product from Molson's or Labatt's, 
um, it's worth no different than a, a, your, your cheap brand beers. The difference is the money they have in, in the brand. They have, it's like no name food opposed to, you know, brand name food. There's not a lot of difference between them. It's the money the company puts into branding. Name a, a business that puts a third of their operating budgets into marketing. It's, that's what it's all about. And people don't realize when you buy a, you know, product from a small brewery, our boxes are made in Hamilton. Our labels are made in Guelph. Our caps are made in Etobicoke. You know, our chemicals are made in, in, in Guelph. Our staff are from Burlington, Hamilton, and Oakville. I can just keep going and going and going. And they don't understand that. 60% um, of what, if you were to buy a craft beer, 60% goes back into the local economy. And that's unheard of because when you look at the big breweries, they're made by, they're owned by the Americans, the Brazilians, and the Japanese now. So look, look at what's happening. And the way we make beer opposed to, you know, a commercial brewery. You know, a brewmaster does not touch anything in a big brewery. He's pushing buttons. If you came to Nickelbrook, our brewmaster is grinding barley, he's grabbing the hops, he's weighing them out, he's measuring all his ingredients, he's pulling all the grain, you know, out of the, the louder ton, we give it to farmers for feed, they come in every other day and it goes to cattle feed, like, it's unbelievable what goes in, we say handcrafted, we, we, we mean it, and you know, the breweries finally starting to do well, but it's because we're going from Windsor to Ottawa, and we were hoping to focus in, in the core area of, you know, of Burlington, making it a main base and it, it's far from our base which is which is sad it's taken the brewery now is six and a half years old and, and this summer was the first year we were at capacity we cannot make beer fast enough but it's because we've done a lot of neat things outside of the box we, we even started making real root beer the brewery is named after my kids Nick and Brooke and you know with long short story but we, we were at a brew pub that was making root beer and I found out that root beer was never a pop, it was a tea, and it was called root tea. 1867, Mr. Hires made root tea, but he couldn't sell it, calling it root tea, so all of a sudden he thought marketing root beer, and it took off on him. But it, it, it's, it's made with herbs and roots and raw sugar and, and, and different stuff. You know, now you look at all the domestic root beers, they're not made that way, it became a pop, it was never a pop. And it actually has taken off for us, and we have, you know, several, natural food stores and bars and pubs that have started carrying it and I think someday we might even have a, a, a bit of a soft drink division. Next one we're going to work on is a, a true ginger beer with a lot of, you know, it's going to have a, a large ginger bite. But it's been a very challenging um, process to build the brewery up. Uh, um, a lot of work, uh, we've got some very hard dedicated staff but it's coming along. But We've been constantly outside of the box and our ingredients, we're trying to buy it locally, but ingredients, believe it or not, is when you buy a case of beer, maybe 10% is ingredients. You can make a lot of beer with uh, a ton of barley. So our barley, most of our barleys come from the prairie, some of them come from Europe, hops, they're starting to grow hops now. We're actually trying to work with some farmers. We tried to get some farmers in Guelph to grow certain hops that we wanted and it failed. So a lot of our hops are coming from the United States and, and uh, from Germany. But it's slowly, because of the growth in the craft industry, there's 40 little breweries in Ontario now, all making neat, great beers. So now there's a focus. A lot of farmers have gone to cash crops. And see, once you grow barley, you have to get it malted. So who's gonna malt it for them? So it becomes a little bit difficult. Beer is made with malted barley, so it has to be germinated, sprouted, and dried, and then you, we, we make beer with it. So it's become difficult to, to get local produce, but our packaging, our labor, is where local is more our, our, our focus. Even our brewery, our brewery was built in Cambridge, Ontario. I could have bought it in China for less money. Our chillers were made in, in Markham, Ontario. We just bought a canner. We spent $120,000 on a canner. And I could have gone to, to Germany, to Italy, to China, and we bought it in Calgary. It cost us a little bit more money, but I wanted to keep it in Canada. We're proud to say that there's virtually no equipment in our brewery that is not made in Canada. 
Um, we have a small balling machine that was just barely $40,000. We have hundreds of thousands of dollars in equipment, all made in Canada. And why would I want to buy a tank that was made in China if I have a problem? You know, we just bought three tanks two years ago and we spent $5,000 more to buy them locally because I said to myself, if I had a problem, I can call 519, dial the number and talk to the person who built the tank. You know, who am I going to talk to if I have a problem with fittings and valves and manholes and stuff? I said, I'm not, I'm not chancing it. Um, so we're very proud to, to say that, you know, we, we buy very, very local. Thanks for listening. Good evening. Um, I'm honored to be with these panelists, just hearing them speak and realizing that they're dealing with the same issues that, as a farmer, I'm dealing with. And it's quite amazing. I was going to start off by trying to find out who you guys are, but I've decided already who you are. Um, I'm looking at a room full of leaders. You may not feel that way right now, but just by entering this room, you know more about local food than most people that you're going to meet during the day your friends and your family members. And so you now have a charge, you have a responsibility, and that's to tell people what you know. Because it's amazing how little people know about something like beer. And beer is mostly corn if you're buying cheap beer. Um, so thanks for that detail, that's quite amazing. Um, and I'm looking around the room to the people on the outer ring, and they're all people who've made a decision in their lives that they're going to do something different around food whether it be a nonprofit organization, whether it be starting a farmer's market like the Oakville um, Harborfront Market, whether it's the growers that are in the room. I know, I think all the growers, very impressed with what they do, um, and the private businesses that are selling food. Each of them has said, I'm going to strike a different path. So they're leaders, and I think you guys are in this room to either find out more about local food. Um, and, and so the end of my, my, my speech was, or my talk was, you have a job now to go spread the word uh, because you're a very small group of people buying local food. Um, John said he has to go all the way to far, far, much farther than he wants to go to sell his food. I'm in the same position. I think of all the people that aren't buying my food. Tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people aren't buying my food. Just a very small number, maybe two or three hundred families support my farm. Um, a little bit about my farm. Uh, we grow on 40 acres. We're a very small farm. Uh, about six to eight acres are vegetables. The rest are pasture, grains, uh, and hay for our livestock. Uh, we do a small amount of livestock, but mostly what we're doing is we're selling vegetables. We sell our vegetables through something called community shared agriculture. Many of you know what that is. Uh, for those of you who don't, the easiest way to describe it is you don't come up to my farm and buy one pack of carrots or beans. You buy a whole season's worth of vegetables. And when you commit to our farm, we commit to you and we grow for you. So this year we grew for 130 families. Um, and each week for 20 weeks they received the vegetables that they grew. Or sorry, that we grew. We do grow them. Um, and we went to markets as well. And we sold at farmers markets. Uh, so that's how we've been um, participating in the local food system. When we started 15 years ago, uh, my wife and I and, and our kids, um, we had very few places to sell food. We couldn't, and we still can't sell our food in a grocery store. Those places are locked out for us. Just not able to do that. Uh, we can't call Walmart up and say, hey, I've got some beans. Do you want to buy them? I don't know if I'd be able to find the buyer, actually, for the company. They would want truckfuls, uh, and we would probably have two or three bushels at a time. Um, so huge difficulties for small farms to sell locally. And that wasn't the case 50 years ago. 50 years ago, a farmer could sell their food to the people that lived in their community. Today, it's very, very difficult. So 15 years ago, we began to figure out how to sell our food. The easiest way was through this system called Community Sharing Agriculture, where we sell direct to families. Uh, we realized that the farmer's markets were also places that we couldn't sell our food. For one reason or another, either distance or the policies and rules that they used, we were locked out of the farmer's markets. I'm from Hamilton. Um, sorry, I currently grow in Hamilton. I'm from Burlington. I was raised in Burlington. Uh, the Hamilton Farmer's Market was not a place that I could sell my food. I could not get in there. And right now, I believe the number of farmers currently at the Hamilton Farmer's Market is around five. And they have a lot of vendors. 
So what's happened is there's been an explosion of farmers markets in Hamilton. We've gone from two farmers markets to somewhere around seven farmers markets, depending on how you define it. And those small new farmers markets are full of local growers and local food processors. So it's very exciting what's happening there. Um, so that's how we participate in the local food system, is that we help develop two of those farmers markets. We go to three of the farmers markets, uh, Lock Street, Dundas, and Ancaster um, are the three that we participate in. We try to stay as close to home as possible. We don't want to go to Toronto and take our food to Toronto. We want to stay within Hamilton. Um, we also do education. So we're doing um, school groups come up to our farm. We have five interns, um, young people that come to the farm, work on the farm in exchange for education, food, and housing. Uh, they work really hard. And they do that for five months during the growing season. We're also doing some work around advocacy. We're working with the city of Hamilton, with other growers and other people from nonprofit organizations, trying to create a sustainable food policy for the city of Hamilton. So it's exciting to know that the Halton Food Council exists and that you guys are doing similar things in Halton as are happening in Hamilton. So that's how we're participating in the, in the local food system. I, I have some areas of concern, some things that need to be addressed, and, and you guys can take some responsibility here. Um, it's really important that when you go to a farmer's market, you know that the food is local and grown sustainably, and that the table that you're buying from the food from is labeled clearly. It's hard sometimes to tell whether the food was bought from the food terminal, and to know how far it came. That's really important. Harbor Front is a, um, uh, the Oakville, I'm not getting the name right, the, the Har Harborside, great market with great labeling. Really, wonderful place. I encourage you to go there. We used to go there, but it was just a bit of a far drive for us. Um, I'm also very concerned about pricing. Um, we have some of the cheapest food in the world. We have one of the most efficient food systems in the world. Um, and that's why we're in trouble. We're in trouble because the food is so cheap compared to what we make. And I know that's hard for you to hear. It's hard for me to hear. Um, but we do need to spend more money on our food. If you buy cheap food, uh, sorry, cheap a cheap pair of shoes, they're going to wear out, and if you do that decade after decade, you're going to have problems with your back, with your, your arches and your feet. Same thing with food. If you don't spend good, good money on food or enough money on food, you're going to, you're going to, you're not going to receive the benefits of that food. So that's another area of concern I have. Um, and then the other really big thing is, we really don't have a lot of farmers selling locally anymore. Most of them are are selling their food into the global food system. And so we have sort of this double-edged problem. We don't have enough people buying local food, and we don't have enough people growing local food. A little bit depressing, but we are at a beginning, and so we need to make a change there. I do have some ideas around solutions. We need to have lots and lots of small farms very close to cities like Burlington and Milton and Hamilton. We need to protect the land closest to our cities because that five or ten kilometer drive seems like an ocean of distance for farmers to get their food into uh, onto the table of local fa uh, families. So we need to encourage new farmers. We need to educate new farmers. There are two programs in southern Ontario that educate farmers around how to run a small business. One is called Farm Start and the other is called Everdale uh, Environmental Learning Centre. So we're beginning to see uh, organizations thinking about how do we support farmers to become good small business owners. I think I'm getting near the end. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. It's exciting to know that a chef spends 10 hours uh, a week looking for food. That's very, very uncommon. Um, I've worked with restaurants. It's so easy to get the food just delivered from wherever it comes from. Um, so when a, when a chef is sourcing like that, it tells you he's quite serious about his menu. It's also exciting to know that Whole Foods might come one day to the Halton area or the Hamilton area and have a store. Wouldn't it be great to have a grocery store that promoted local food and sustainably grown food? That would be really exciting. We don't have that right now. We have, we have large grocery stores that promote international food that's very, very cheap. So, um, you guys are all part of the solution, and so I encourage you to put some pressure on your friends and family. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chris, and uh, I couldn't agree more that we are really part of the solution in terms of um, our buying.
buying power and, and looking for local foods when we are shopping, um, talking to the farmers when we're at farmers markets, making sure that those vegetables are actually sourced close by and not just brought in. So um, some excellent um, information um, from, from Chris and the rest of our panelists.